Well, God bless you. Uh, we're going to be looking at Keep the Right Perspective. That's the title here, Keep the Right Perspective. And we're going to go to Genesis 1, and we're going to uh, look at verse 26. I got uh, some things that you're familiar with, but I want to lay this out before we get into the meat of the word. So Genesis 1, 26, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And his image is spirit. So many people want to say his image is flesh and blood. We know from John 4, 24, God's image is spirit. God created man. He put spirit in the image of God. Male and female, he put it in both of them. And then God blessed them. And God said unto them, you're on your own. Absolutely not. These are his children. God says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish and the fowls and every living thing that's moving on the earth. And then verse 29 says, behold, I have given you. Behold, I have given you. All right, something's going on that's really weird at the moment. Uh, so anyway, I'm just going to keep teaching, and we'll go from there. All right, Mike Pruitt, uh, they're saying that you, you're, you've done something. Uh, so anyway, um, God said he has given you. That's the key. God gave you. God is giving it to them. God's not asking for them for anything. Okay? Um, God gave them food, herb-bearing seed upon the face of the earth, all the tree, all the fruit. He gave them good quality things. That, that's what he did. So let's move on to 2 Corinthians 11. So this is what God is doing. And to, to give the shortened, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. To give the shortened version of this, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. We know uh, that things didn't go accordingly. And then here's the shortened version that God gives us in 2, 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. God put them in the garden. Everything is great. Everything is wonderful. And then, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled, deceived, seduced Eve through his subtlety, so your mind, your thinking processes, should be corrupted from the uh, integrity or the purity of Christ. So basically, God said, I'm going to give you all this stuff. You've got a dominion lease. Things are wonderful and great. You don't need anything. Just stay in touch with me and stay away from that one tree. Don't eat of it. Then Eve was seduced. Now, if Eve can get seduced in the garden of paradise, when everything is good, good, very good, this exhortation is still very real for all of us today, that our thinking processes get corrupted from the integrity of Christ. We want to keep the purity of Christ, all right? So now look at uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, since we're here. The dominion lease that was given to Adam. If you've ever had a lease and then you subleased it to somebody else, they take over and have it as long as the lease was. Well, that's what happened in this situation. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this age, the God of this age, is blinding the mind. And again, it's, the, it's for Nema, the thinking processes. The God of this age is blinding thinking processes to those who are unbelievers. Less, he doesn't want the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, to shine unto them. He doesn't want all of that, okay? He doesn't want people to see Christ and know about Christ. That's his objective. That's his goal, to stop all the knowledge of Christ. And do whatever it takes. All right? He deceived Eve, got her thinking processes to think about something else, 
and he's looking at a similar type thing here. So he is the God of this age because, go to uh, Luke 4, because of Adam, Adam's sin, he gave his dominion lease. He subleased the, the earth, uh, the dominion of the earth over to the God of this age. Not good for mankind, but the lease is going to end. Now, Luke 4, 6, we read, and the devil said unto Jesus, all of this authority, all this power, all this authority, I'm going to give you, and I'll give you the glory. I'll give you the splendor of it all. You will be worshipped as a God, even though you're just the son of God. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I can give it. It was delivered unto me when Adam sinned, and now I can give it to you if you want it. It's all yours. Just a couple little wrinkles and catches in there. You know, a little bit of deception involved in all of that. Now, with that, let's go back to Genesis 3.15. So, the God of this age is a terrible host to those who believe or want to believe about Jesus Christ being the Lord, about Jesus Christ replacing. Done. Now, Genesis 3.15. We read, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise or crush thy head, and thou shalt strike his heel. Now, what this is saying is that the fight's on. The war's on. i am now got the dominion lease. I'm the God of this age. I'm the God of this world. I've got it. I have control. I'm going to make anybody's life on earth miserable because that's what I do. I'm going to steal from them, steal their time, steal their efforts, steal their healings. I'm going to try and murder It's very interesting. We went from the Garden of Eden, the deception that happened, and then this is the next thing that God records in his word. 4-1. Adam knew uh, Eve's wife. She conceived, and she bare Cain. And said, oh, I got the man. I got the man from the Lord. I got the Savior. Here he is. And it turns out uh, that's wrong. And she... And it came to pass. This process of time means that God specifically told Cain and Abel to come to a specific location, to bring a specific sacrifice, to be reminded of the promise of Genesis 3.15. That there needs to be a Savior who will shed his blood for all of mankind. That, that he hasn't forgotten. God hasn't forgotten. He's still coming. And that needs to be kept alive until he, until he does come. And the adversary wanted everybody to forget about the fact that the promised seed of the woman was going to happen. So in the process of time, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. In Abel, he also brought, but he would Hebrew, firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he didn't have respect. And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you do as I asked? I specifically told you what to bring. Why is your countenance followed? You, you disobeyed me. If thou does well, shall thou not be accepted? If you did as you were asked in this process of time, come to a place of the right sacrifice, knowing and recognizing a bl blood sacrifice, it wouldn't have been any problem. Now, God is... Sin lies at the door. What? Okay. If thou do, if you would have listened and done what was proper, I'm going to give you an. I'm going to give you a way out. Sin is a sin offering, and there's no door. Uh, basically, there was an entrance into the area where they were supposed to be doing the sacrifice. But at the entrance of this, there's a sin offering. There's an animal there. Either God provided the animal, or He told. Um, able to bring a second animal but there is a sin offer you didn't bring the proper um it's like bringing light beer to a german beer festival all right you got to bring the right stuff okay so here it is there's a sin offering at the door 
at the entranceway. Go back and get it, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, this animal will be like Mr. Mittens here. He won't run away. Go over and get the sacrifice, bring it back, and sacrifice it properly. This tells us a couple things. God's mercy, God's planning, and that at this particular time, he wasn't born of the seed, which we'll look at here in a moment, that he wasn't of the adversary. God was giving him a way out. God was saying, look, it's right here. I'm supplying it for you. Recognize God's mercy is incredible here. And then you can just see Cain walking over, looking at it, starting to grab it, fighting amongst himself, and then storming out. And boom, the adversary had him. Cain then, verse 8, talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, this is the nature now of, of seed people, those who belong to the adversary, murdering, death. We'll see this in a moment when Jesus Christ deals with these people. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him, murdered him. And the Lord said to Cain, where's Abel? I can't find him anywhere. There's only a couple of people on earth. I mean, you know, where's your brother? Hey, hey, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. And God said, what has thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And then God hit him with a bolt of lightning and took him out. No, that's not how a loving, kind, merciful God is. He allowed him to live his life. This is the only life he's going to get. But he allowed him because Cain was concerned that people were going to hunt him down and kill him. And he says, no, that's not going to happen either. You chose this direction. This is your life. This is all you get. I'm not, you know, so live it. Uh, and then the Cain, Cain's line really is interesting as it follows through. But jump to 1 John 3. So the blood of Abel cries out. Well, still is today. 1 John 3, we'll pick it up in verse 10. Because we're going to see the nature of the God of this world and those who sell out to him. And it hasn't changed. 1 John 3.10. In this, the children of God are manifest, are evident. God's children are evident. And you know who else is evident? The children of the devil. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, this will speak very loudly in our day and time and hour as it has for the last 6,000 years. In this, the children of God are evident, and so are the children of the devil. Whosoever does not justice is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. But don't love like Cain did. Cain who murdered his brother, not as Cain who was you know, of the wicked one or from the wicked one. Cain who was from the wicked one. Then he slew his brother. He slaughtered his brother. So the time of, from the offering, the time when they went off together is when he sold out and became of the wicked one. And therefore slew he him. Why? Because his own works were evil and his brother's works were righteous. Envy, jealousy, to the point of allowing spirits to help him murder his brother. Now, Verse 13, in light of that, don't marvel if the world hates you. Don't be astonished at the world wants to get rid of you because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised seed of the woman, the one who rejected the adversary trying to buy him out with splendor and glory and power. Don't marvel at this. It's just how he operates. It's First occasion, first time in the word of God of a seed person, something belonging of the devil, from the devil, of the wicked one. How did he live? Look at Hebrews 11. Basically, 11.4, Hebrews 11.4. How did he, what was the illustration? He was a murderer. Hebrews 11.4. By believing, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead yet speaks. That happened, you know, 
thousands of years ago, but we're still talking about his righteous sacrifice today. He's still speaking to us today through the word. Look at 1224. Hebrews 1224. We see. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, or into his sprinkled blood. Jesus sprinkled his blood, and it speaks even better than that of Abel. Abel's blood speaks to us, but Jesus speaks even louder, even clearer. Um, his sprinkled blood speaks of better things, of what he accomplished. Abel lost his life, Christ lost his life, but Christ redeemed all of mankind. All right, now go to John 10.10. 10. Again, a very familiar verse, but again, to help us set the stage here so we are aware of what's going on spiritually because we've been trained to think a certain way where we've been trained to think what does the word of god say and to live off of what the word says and we can from that view we can see the world and they the adversary did everything he could to get to the christ while he was alive john 10 10 in a nutshell the thief his purpose steal kill destroy steal your peace right steal your health steal your time, steal anything he can from you to keep you too busy to serve the one true God. All right. And then he'll take your life to kill you if possible and destroy you to keep you from getting eternal life. That's what he's trying to do. Instead, Jesus Christ was present so that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And despite the insanity of the world every day since genesis 3 15 what do we have we can live a more abundant life through the accomplishments of christ it's very much available look at chapter 8 john 8 39 in john 8 39 we open by by reading they answered and said unto him in a moment we'll see who the they are abraham is our father and Jesus said, you know what? If you really were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. Right? People talk about their ancestry. Hey, I'm you know, I'm related to Abraham. Well, if you really would, you'd do the same thing if you're children of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. Who is behind all of that? The God of this world, the God of this age. He wants these people to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. You're seeking to kill me. And why? Because I'm a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. I, you want to kill me because I'm speaking the truth. Well, who's the truth? God, Jesus Christ, the Word, the Spirit. He's talking about things of the spiritual nature. And that's why they wanted to kill him, because they can't handle the light. You do the deeds of your father. Well, that's taking up a notch here in 41. He's telling them, they, you know, their deeds are of their father. And, of course, they came immediately right back at him with an accusation. Well, we're not born of fornication. We only got one father. We've got God. Yeah, well, words are nothing. Let's see what kind of actions they have. Jesus said to them, if God really was your father, then you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but God sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Why don't you get this? Hello, McFly, you know, hello. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Because you cannot hear my word. It just bounces off. It cannot be put in the mind. Why? Why do you not understand? Because you are of your father, the devil. I love it when Jesus Christ kind of speaks, you know, and gets around the, right at him. You, you know, he always loved everybody except those who were sold out to the adversary. There's nothing he could do for them. Incorruptible seed, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely nothing can be done. They're not getting it. They can't get it. You are of your father, the devil. And what are you, is going to be your actions? And the lust of your father you will do. He was, a, and now we're going to give examples of what the lust of the fathers are. Well, let's start how about this one. He was a murderer from the beginning. No, we just read that with Cain. He was a murderer from the beginning. 
and he abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him those who sell out to the world they don't there's no truth in them for he speaks a lie when he speaks a lie he speaks of his own because he is a liar and the father of it here's another one of the lusts uh you know of the father lying deception deceiving he is a liar and he's the father of them and because i tell you these things i tell you the truth you believe me not which of you convicts me of sin and if i say the truth why don't you believe me he that is of god hears god's words and that's all of us we are of god we heard god's word and we're thankful for god's word you therefore hear them not because you are not of god well that kind of puts things in perspective doesn't it a little bit of boldness a little bit of right to the punch a little bit of our understanding these were important people these were the sanhedrin the governing body these were the people working with rome getting paid off by rome to keep the people in check all right let's go to uh luke luke 12. we'll start in verse 1. luke 12 verse 1. all right luke 12 1. in the meantime when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people in so much that they you know they were tripping over each other he began to say his the disciples guys you need to understand something here first of all beware of the leaven of the pharisees it's hypocrisy so he's telling them that the pharisees are bad cooks no he's using leaven as a figure of speech remember a little leaven leavens the whole lump you get a little bit of evil in there and it affects the whole body it affects everything so he's telling them beware of the infectious things that the pharisees the leaders the religious people the governmental people what these people are trying to do beware because it's hypocrisy it's not true they say one thing and they live something else hypocrisy for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed neither hid that shall not be known therefore whatsoever you have spoken in darkness it's going to be heard in the light and that which you have spoken in the air and closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, look at what Jesus is saying to his disciples. I'm talking to you, my friends. Be, you know, be aware of the leaven. And don't be afraid of them that can kill the body. And after that, if no more they can do to you. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell, the Gehenna to eternal darkness forever yay that's the one you ought to fear look god is aware of what's going on he understands that the price of five sparrows are two farthings but god understands none of those are forgotten with him but even the very hairs you know hairs of your head are numbered fear not therefore you are more valuable than the birds also i say unto you whosoever shall confess me before men him shall the son of man also confess before the angels of god but he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it can be forgiven him. But unless they uh, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, which is the unforgivable sin, which is having your seed being given to the devil, you know, everything can be forgiven you except that. And, you know, they're going to call you in this, you know, you're going to be brought before synagogues and magistrates and powers. Don't take any unnecessary thought how or what things you're going to say, because if that happens, the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to know, or what you need to speak at that particular moment, what you ought to say. It'll be there. And then I love verse 13. Not really. He's giving this incredible insight into what is happening. And then he gets to verse 13. And one of the companies says, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Hello. Look at the person, and everybody's kind of, you know, everybody kind of looks at the person like, aren't you listening? Dude, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? That's not my job. Listen to what else I have to say. Take heed. Beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. It isn't how much you own. It isn't how much that you accomplish for the world. 
What are you doing for God? That's what counts the most. And he's laying it out. Hopefully this guy stuck around and listened to more of what Jesus had to say. Look at uh, verse 27 of this chapter. Luke 12, 27, we read, look at these beautiful. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Look, if God can clothe the grass, which is in the field, tomorrow it's cast into the oven, how much more can he take care of you, O ye of little believing? Seek not. Don't put all your efforts on what are you going to eat, what are you going to drink. And don't be doubtful. Oh, God, help all that. No, no, no. Listen to what God has to say and do it. Don't be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows you have need of these things. Instead, seek the kingdom of God. And all, everything else will be there. Just keep moving with the things, the kingdom of God, what things pertaining to Jesus Christ, all the things that you know spiritually, and everything else will fall into place, even if you've got to move to North Carolina for a while. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Have no fear. God's people in this day and time, it's God's good pleasure that he gives you and all of us the kingdom. Nice cushy chairs in the kingdom. All right, let's go down to uh, Luke 18 now. Luke 18, 28. He's warning the people. He's laying it out. Luke 18, 28. We read. Then Peter, you know, Jesus is making a point. And Peter says, hey, we left everything to follow you. Don't we get a pat on the back, and, you know, at least Jesus? And Jesus said, verse 29, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom's sake, for the kingdom of God's sake, not, not because they want, you know, for their own wealth or, you know, all those kind of things, but for the God's, if they have a special calling left everything, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. So uh, is it going to be worth it? Whatever you left behind, whatever direction you were, whatever else may have happened before God called you? Oh, absolutely. God will not only take care of you now. Look at how much more life everlasting. All right, Matthew 21. There's just so many different things in the Gospels, imagine that, to look at that I had to narrow it down to 40 of them. Well, maybe not quite that many. But Matthew 21, 45. Matthew 21, 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard that Jesus was speaking parables and heard what the parables were, they perceived, they knew that he was speaking to them about them. Imagine that. And so what was their reply? I think we ought to change. No. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the fourth branch of government, the people. Because they took him for a prophet, which he was. They were the world's leaders of that time frame in that area wanted to take him out because they were afraid of him, but they were more afraid of the people and the rebellion that could happen. So they had to do it on the sly, pay somebody to set him up in the Garden of Gethsemane later. Look at Matthew 23. We'll pick it up in verse 29. Matthew 20, 27, rather. Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you religious leaders of that day and time who are supposed to be teaching people and standing for God. For you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous. You look just before men. But within, you're just like the dead man's bones. You are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You want to make laws, but you don't want to live them. You want to control other people's lives. You're full of hypocrisy and you're full of lawlessness and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and you adorn or garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, 
We would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Yes, our fathers killed the prophets. We wouldn't have. And look at what Jesus is going to say. 31, wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. You have the same lineage. You're serving the same doggone false God that they served in killing, the spokesman for God's people. Matthew 5. Sounds like the Pharisees and the religious leaders at that time weren't doing their job. They were getting really wealthy and looking good, but they were not teaching the truth, which is why this is so incredible to the people. Because the people, right, the deplorables, they saw all of this. They recognized things weren't good. Things weren't right. Matthew 5. So look how Jesus handles the hearts of the common people. Matthew 5, 1, the Sermon on the Mount. He saw the multitudes. He went up on a little mountain. He got his disciples together, and he opened his mouth, which is what we need to continue to do. He opened his mouth, and he taught them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, poor in spirit, it, it's an idiom. It means the humble. Blessed are the humble, not those who are prospering in this day and time un unrighteously, but the humble. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Would you rather have the kingdom of earth or the kingdom of heaven? I'll take the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they that mourn. They're going to be comforted. Many people are mourning because of decisions in the world. But they're going to be comforted, those who believe on the Christ. Blessed are the meek, because the meek are the one who are going to inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled, and they'll have a joyous life. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's not quite what they're learning in their synagogue, but Jesus nails it. Blessed are you. You're the ones that are going to inherit the greatness of the kingdom of God and have everlasting life with a new spiritual body and all the other great things that are in store. So consider these things. Look at Matthew uh, 13. Matthew 13, verse 10. Matthew 13, 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, why are you speaking in parables? Look, a very good question. And he said, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that which he has. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, and they don't understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing, you shall hear, but you're not going to understand. And seeing, you shall see, and you're not going to perceive it. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Thus at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with the heart, and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see. Blessed are your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, there are many prophets and a lot of righteous men that would have loved to have been alive at this day and time and hour with the Lord Jesus Christ himself, desire to see the things that you see, but they haven't seen them, and hear the things that you hear, but they haven't heard them. Oh, I, how many people back here? Loads of people would have loved to have been there. Would you, you know what I mean? Sitting by the Sea of Galilee, a little warm, but that's okay. Listening to Jesus himself speak. Wow. So many people would love to have been there. But we've got something greater, which we'll get to in a moment, because he accomplished everything. He was in the process of accomplishing it. Go to John 18. He was in the process of, of accomplishing it. But we have it. John 18, 36. John 18, 36. 
my kingdom is not of this world. He's there in front of Pontius Pilate. And Pilate being the Roman proconsul, he's the guy in charge on behalf of Rome to deal with what's going on. He was the government, of which was the instrument for which the religious leaders who were of the devil utilized to take the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he was a murderer from the beginning. They'll use whatever tools they can. My kingdom is not of this world. Sounds like a song. Right? This world is not our home. If my kingdom, though, was of this world, then you, would have been, you guys would have, been, have, have, have had it had hell to pay. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. And Pilate said, your king then? Jesus said, you know, you say I am. All right. To this end, though, was I born. Here's my purpose, Pilate. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, and everyone that is of the truth will hear my voice. Boy, we wish there was millions and billions of people that would hear the voice of the truth. But I'm thankful that we have and others have. So he came to, he taught the kingdom. Go to Romans 12. And he said, there will be those who will listen, who will hear. Romans 12, 19. So a reminder, it's not time to fight for his kingdom on earth. His kingdom is still a heavenly kingdom, which we, we tell people about. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will, I will repay, says the Lord. We have to continue to remember that. Don't waste time thinking about revenge and vengeance and avenging yourself. That's God's job, and he will do a much better job of it than we will, okay? So a reminder, keep moving, keep glorifying God, keep speaking about the kingdom of God. Let people know about Jesus Christ and his accomplishments. Everything on earth changed when this happened. Acts 2 1. Very familiar scriptures. Acts 2 1. Everything is different now. Christ fully accomplished everything, ascended into heaven, and now the day of Pentecost had fully come. And they were all one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them, and every single one of them, and later 3,000 more that day, are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they proved it by speaking in tongues as God, the giver, gave them the utterance. Acts 4.12, Peter was letting people know what was going on. In Acts 4.12, he summarizes it very briefly into one incredible statement. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You can believe in all the rulers and the ex-rulers and the past rulers and the good men of whatever. There's only one way to heaven. That's through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way you're going to get saved. It's the only way other people will get saved. First Thessalonians 4. It's going to get better. We don't have time to waste. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, great reminder, the Lord is coming back. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, a summering shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. Dead in Christ will rise first. They which uh, 
then we which remain, you know, are alive and remain, are snatched up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Mike, it's over with. It's that. It's going to happen. It's going to happen that way. Look at Revelation. Oh, we're supposed to comfort each other. Verse 18. Encourage each other. Comfort each other by those words. Instead of talking about the insanity of the world all the time and those who have sold out to the wrong God and are murderers and liars and hypocrites, look at what we get to talk about. He's coming back. He's coming back. New spiritual bodies. Comfort, encourage one another. I was like reading the end of the book, Revelation 21 1. A couple, couple verses here, then we're almost done. Revelation 21 1. God is showing John the future. And I saw the new heaven, I saw a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. No more sea, no more wavering. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride or adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven that said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, no more pain. No more high blood pressure. No more pain. For the former things are passed away. So, 1 Corinthians 4. That's something I always look forward to. And we're going to. It's going to happen. The gathering together. And then when everybody is resurrected, new spiritual bodies. And we have giant parties forever, forever, and forever. 1 Corinthians 4, 1. So, let a man and or woman so account of us as ministers of christ and we are to be stewards of the mysteries of god moreover it is required in a steward that a man be found faithful faithful trustworthy has been given the knowledge of christ and will in turn teach it live it but with me it's a very small thing that i should be judged or examined of you who are you to examine my life or of human judgment or human days or court days? I should be judged in the court of my humans? No. Yeah, I don't even examine my own self. For I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges or examines me is the Lord. He's the one that's keeping the accurate count. So therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who hath who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will bring, will make manifest the deliberations, the counsels, the deliberations of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise from God. That's when the final praise is going to be there. And we close in 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. We start in 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. The deliberations of the heart, the hidden things that we all going to be brought forth. All the hypocrisy will be exposed, 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. And we read. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. He that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also has given unto us the down payment, the earnest of the Spirit. We have the Spirit. We've got the proof then that everything else is going to come to pass. Therefore, we are always confident. We're always confident knowing. While we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We all know it's great to be at the park and having a giant great fellowship together with everybody, but we're not with the Lord yet, which would be much better. We know that because we walk by believing. We don't walk by appearance, but we are confident and we're willing. I'm more than willing rather to be absent from this wonderful body to be at home with the Lord, to be present with the Lord. Wouldn't you rather be with have the gathering together, a new spiritual body, all of us together there? That's what he's saying. Hey, I'm, I'm willing to you know, give up the rest of my earthly life for that. I think all of you would be too. We're confident. We're willing to be absent from the body, to be present or at home with the Lord. Wherefore, keep working, 
we labor that whether we're present or absent, whether we're still on earth or we've already been gathered together, we may be well pleasing of him. We're doing what God asks us to do. Whatever our part in the body is, we're doing that now because we're all going to appear before the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, and everyone's going to receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The bad will be washed away, burnt up, gone, and the good will be rewarded. We'll be compensated for all eternity. What all does that mean? I don't know, but it's a promise of God, and it's going to be good. No, it's going to be very good. No, it's going to be extremely incredible. That is what we got to look forward to. So, Father, thank you for your word and that we don't need to be concerned with the affairs of this world. We understand they affect us, but they don't affect us like not knowing your son and not knowing your will and doing what we can for your kingdom in this day and time and hour, whatever it is we're supposed to be doing. We're grateful to be alive and to be part of the body now. We can praise you. We can pray to you. We can love you and teach others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.